Hello and welcome to Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. I'm Ian Masters and today we'll examine a number of stories and issues in the news. We'll begin with a MAGA Republican effort underway to shut down non-profits they don't like, disguised as an anti-terrorism bill that the House is about to vote on for a second time. The bill would give Trump's Secretary of the Treasury the unilateral power, without presenting evidence, to cancel a non-profit If, for example, Trump wakes up one day and decides he's mad at the ACLU, then it's out of business. Joining us to assess the likely passage of this ominous bill is Noah Hurwitz, a journalist based in New York City whose work has appeared in Rolling Stone, The Village Voice, The Buffalo, New York Magazine and many others. He's the author of El Chapo, the untold story of the world's most infamous drug lord, And we'll discuss his article at The Intercept, House GOP Moves to Ram Through Bill That Gives Trump Unilateral Powers to Kill Non-Profits. Then we'll look into the possibility that following Comcast's decision to cast off its cable assets like MSNBC and CNBC, someone like Elon Musk could buy a controlling interest in the new company and turn MSNBC into a platform for right-wing trolls. Joining us is William Cohan, a former senior Wall Street investment banker for 17 years at Lazard Freer & Company, Merrill Lynch, and J.P. Morgan Chase, as well as a New York Times bestselling author whose books include Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World, House of Cards, A Tale of Hubris and Wretched Excess on Wall Street, and most recently, Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Icon. A founding partner at Puck News, we'll discuss his latest article, Cable prepares for the value extraction era. Then finally, with the U.S. Embassy in Kiev evacuated because of fears Putin will retaliate against Biden's permission to allow Ukraine to fire longer-range missiles into Russia, and with undersea cables in the Baltic cut by Russian hybrid warfare operations, we will speak with Michael Gorham, professor of Russian studies at the University of Florida. The recent Archie K. Davis Fellow at the National Humanities Center, he served for 12 years as Associate Editor of the Russian Review and is the author of multiple award-winning books on Russian language and politics, including After Newspeak and Speaking in Soviet Tongues. He is currently completing a book on the impact of the Internet and social media on Russian political communications called Networking Putinism, The Rhetoric of Power in the Digital Age, And we'll discuss what state media is saying about the war in Ukraine that Putin is calling a war by the United States against Russia. Before we begin, rather than escape to Canada for some imaginary sanctuary from MAGA fascism, we now must stand our ground and rebuild an opposition movement that will bridge the divide Trump has exploited with false promises to his voters in order to reward his billionaire buddies who have already bought the Supreme Court and are in the process of buying the entire government. Being educated doesn't make you an elitist, and knowledge and opportunity should be shared with those left behind who are our brothers and sisters, not our enemies. So Background Briefing's mission of building a reality-based community in post-truth America is now more urgent than ever, and as one of Trump's enemies of the people, join me in a struggle between the plutocrats who no longer believe in democracy and the people who have to defend it or see it die. Please make a tax-deductible donation at backgroundbriefing.org slash donate or at our foundation publictruthmedia.org And thank you as we work to make a more perfect union in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And joining us now is Noah Hurwitz, who is a journalist based in New York City, whose work has appeared in Rolling Stone, The Village Voice, The Baffler, New York Magazine, and many others. He's the author of El Chapo, the untold story of the world's most infamous drug lord. And he has an article at The Intercept, House GOP moves to ram through bill that gives Trump unilateral power to kill non-profits. Welcome to Background Briefing, Noah Hurowitz. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. And this bill called the Stop Terror Financing and Tax Penalties on American Hostages Act, known as H.R. 9495, it originally started uh, as a result of the campus protests, the pro-Palestinian protests, along with, particularly out here at UCLA, the violent attacks from pro-Israel partisans. So that's the origin of this bill. 
But last week, the legislation failed on a suspension vote, which is a procedural mechanism requiring two-thirds majority to pass. 52 Democrats joined almost all of the Republicans, but 144 Democrats and one Republican, exactly one-third of the House of Representatives, voted against the bill. But now it's come back like a zombie. And Mm -hmm. it's going to be voted on tomorrow morning. And it is incredibly important that uh, this bill gets stopped. So uh, people have been speaking out. Representative Lloyd Doggett, Texas Democrat in the House, spoken out eloquently. Chris Murphy, the senator from Connecticut, also has. Where does it stand, Noah? To be perfectly honest, it looks like the bill will probably pass. As you said, it was able to be stopped last week because it was brought uh, under suspension of the rules, which requires a two thirds uh, majority. Up until last week, this bill was viewed as fairly bipartisan, right? There was a, a, a different version of the bill was passed in the House in April with, and you know, it was, it was a 382 in favor, 11 against. Right. So the only um, the only people who voted against it last time in April were uh, 10 Democrats, including every member of the squad and a few others. And uh, Republican uh, Thomas Massey from Kentucky, who is he's you know, he's a a Tea Party alum, libertarian minded, and he's he's kind of broken with the GOP uh, over there. The party's staunch support of Israel over the past year now. When you know, when Congress came back uh, for the lame duck session last week, this bill was kind of snuck onto the calendar uh, uh, for a suspension vote. Which you know, they put those bills up for a suspension vote, whether or not it's going to have bipartisan support. But it really seemed like this one might. So I published my first story about this for the Intercept um, on uh, what last. Sunday, so a week and a half ago, Um, and suddenly, you know, it it started to get a lot of attention, right? And so the, you know, the ACLU who had been lobbying against it and a number of other civil society groups who had been lobbying against it really um, seized this this sudden momentum. And Lloyd Doggett, as you said, of of Texas, really came out as like the public face of Democrats in the House opposing it. And um, there was a kind of dramatic vote on that Tuesday night, um, and it was it did not get the votes needed. But as you said, 52 Democrats supported it, um, and going into the vote tomorrow, uh, even if every single Democrat voted against it, uh, it, it would very likely pass because the GOP has control of the House, and even without uh, you know Representative Massey's vote, they would still have the numbers to pass it. And it's very unlikely that all 52 Democrats who voted for it last week are going to vote against it tomorrow. So far, we have seen exactly one of those 52 Democrats come out against it. Um, Angie Craig, Representative Angie Craig of Minnesota, um, came out today and said, you know, having seen the, uh, having seen some of the, nominees that, that Trump has named for his cabinet, I've become increasingly concerned that H.R. 9495 would be used inappropriately by the incoming administration. So that's one Democrat that, you know, that if we go by the number that voted in favor last week, there's now 51, um, even if all of them come out against it tomorrow, uh, it is very likely to pass the House. Now, the Senate is another story. Um, I, I haven't, you know, again, this, this bill was um, pretty bipartisan up until a week ago. And the, the deciding factor, it seems, has been Trump, right? I, I, what has really swung um, a number of Democrats to, to oppose it is that they don't want these powers to be in the hands of the Trump administration. Apparently, they were fine handing these powers over to the Treasury Department um, with, uh, with a Democrat in power. Uh, but Trump to them is is another matter. Now you can you know you can argue that that is not principled. You can argue that that is um, you know that, that they were okay with targeting pro Palestine groups if it was a Democrat in charge. I think all of that is true. 
Um, but they really, you know, they, with the help of Lloyd Duggett, who has really been sounding the alarm about what Trump could do with this, uh, many Democrats came around. The, the leadership, however, has been pretty quiet, right? Um, Hakeem Jeffries, who's the, the House Minority Leader, has not really spoken about it. He voted against it last week, but he has left the whipping of votes to Doggett and to the, the civil society groups that are uh, urging members to vote no. I have reached out to a number of Democratic senators. Um, you know, Chris, as you said, Chris Murphy uh, has spoken against it. As far as I know, he's the only Democratic senator to have um, spoken publicly about it. You know, Chuck Schumer has not, has not responded to multiple requests for comment from myself. Um, and so it's possible that the, de the Democratic controlled Senate would just let it die this session. Um, it's also possible that it could get snuck in uh, in some kind of UN bill, uh, anything is possible. It could happen this session. Uh, and if it doesn't, I, I find it pretty likely that it would pass next session when the GOP is in full control. But I don't understand how they didn't notice in the first <laughs> go around that this bill would give a secretary of treasury. And now, of course, it'll be Trump's secretary of the treasury. And understandably, people are alarmed at the choices he's made so far. So yeah. it gives this person, this Secretary of Treasury, unilateral power without presenting every, any evidence to cancel a non-profit. So what could happen then is if Trump wakes up one day and decides he's mad at the ACLU, he makes a phone call to his Secretary of the Treasury, who will be, I'm sure, a toady like the rest of them, and the ACLU will be out of business, right? The ACLU, I think, has deeper pockets than most. But, you know, I think I think generally speaking, um, this bill, you know, it, it has a few guardrails. It, there is an appeals process. There is, you know, ultimately you can appeal to district court. And I think, it, it, you know, its proponents would argue that that, that you know, a, a totally capricious uh, designation of, you know, terrorist supporting organization would not hold up at the fine, you know, it, in those checks and balances, but for most small organizations, um, or really any organizations, that kind of designation could be the kiss of death, right? If 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 they have their tax exempt status revoked, they're done. Um, and but even if, especially for groups like, you know, groups that are working in the Middle East, groups that are pro Palestine, uh, groups that are, you know, potentially easily labeled as terrorist organizations, like. It, it, it's it's really hard to imagine most donors, especially big donors, uh, giving money to a group that that has been, um, you know, e even has the whiff of of accusations of, of supporting terrorism, because that opens up liability to you know, that makes the donor potentially liable. It's just you know, even if a a group were to make it through the appeals process, um, it would really it would be really destructive, and so. The issue is, I mean, the issue is yes. Like we know that Trump is a capricious uh, person. We know that he, you know, leans on his um, on the people that he that report to him, uh, who you know they in turn know that they need to be loyal. So it's very easy to picture him coming down on you know using this as a way to come down on uh, on groups that have uh, political projects or. Uh, doing or doing work, or even to say things that he doesn't like, and whether or not that would actually stand up is almost immaterial because by the time most groups would get through that appeals process, they'd be screwed. And furthermore, whether or not that capricious you know designation happens, this is a you know this is a sort of a, a preemptive chilling of free speech, right? If I'm a if I'm running a nonprofit and I know that it, it is possible to be designated in this way, I need to, you know, I have a responsibility to make sure my work continues. I have a responsibility to, you know, maybe I'm a humanitarian group, maybe I'm providing aid. Um, you know, it, it's really easy to see how groups might shy away from issues that could get them in trouble, that could get them designated. And so that, whether or not these, you know, these designations happen, the fear of them is a direct attack on free speech. And it is, you know, it's, it's deeply reminiscent of, of other 
countries where we've seen, you know, what, what, what the political scientists would refer to as a uh, democratic backsliding, right? We've seen in Israel, in Hungary, in Russia, these attacks on civil society as sort of a, a you know, a consolidation of power by either, you know, in the, in the case of Hungary or Russia by, you know, by a, a budding autocrat, or in the case of Israel, a consolidation of power by an apartheid regime. But just in the last couple of minutes then, Noah, if the ACLU made some statement in support of Palestine and the humanitarian catastrophe going on there, or if they supported a Palestinian activist um, who APAC and the Israelis don't like, and obviously APAC's fingerprints are all over this bill at any rate, would that be sufficient for Trump to decide? I mean, how much... It evidence they need they don't need much it's, it's unilateral pretty, and... yeah i mean it's it's pretty uh it's pretty vague the bill um it's pretty vague about what would need to be presented there's some sort of circular logic there of like a material a, a terrorist supporting organization is a group that provides material support to terrorists um which you know a tells you that this is already you know it's already against the law to provide material support for terrorism um it, it also you know, it stipulates that that the um, that the Treasury Secretary does need to show some evidence, but may withhold evidence if there is a pressing, uh, you know, national security concern about the evidence that they have, right? And so there, it, there's not a lot of transparency. There's not a lot of um, specifics, and uh, it it just it just really leaves things kind of wide open for this to be enforced as the treasury secretary and as the guy who appointed the treasury secretary sees fit. Well, it looks like he could drive a truck through those ambiguities. And uh, yes. as he pointed out earlier, and as is no mystery to me and our listeners, Trump is disastrous in every respect. And look at who he's choosing so far. Maybe the secretary of treasury won't be as bad as Gates and Hag Seth and Tulsi Gabbard, but uh, that's a small comfort, I would say. Yeah, I'm not holding my breath for you know any kind of adult to be <laughs> to be nominated, and I think that even you know we saw in the in the previous like Trump administration that even you know I think there were a lot of people who went in, who like were in that administration who, you know, I have my own problems with many of them, but they, they, you know, weren't necessarily huge fans of Trump, but they felt like, okay, there needs to be an adult in the room. And one thing that we saw was that, uh, you know, Trump was, was very good at marginalizing those, those supposedly like sober voices. And he was very good at, um, you know, making sure that his agenda such as it was went through. He also is, you know, is, he has his pet projects. He has his things that he's obsessed with, and he he ha has a tendency to like allow other interests to run the show as long as it doesn't take away from his you know spotlight. And so I also can imagine a world in which he is uh, you know isn't really paying attention to the to the treasury, but his allies who you know are are very close to Netanyahu, who are who are very close to APAC, who are very close to. Um, some of the you know more extreme fringes of the pro-Israel lobby would use that you know it, it doesn't right. just have to come to from Trump right to, but to all it takes to. now is a phone call from Miriam Adelson that's all it takes exactly. with Trump I thank you for joining us I appreciate it thanks so much for having me again I've been speaking with Noah Horowitz who is a journalist based in New York City whose work has appeared in Rolling Stone The Village Voice The Baffler New York Magazine and many others he's the author of El Chapo The Untold Story of the World's Most Infamous Drug Lord and he has an article at The Intercept House GOP Moves to Ram Through Bill That Gives Trump Unilateral Power to Kill Nonprofits We're going to take a brief station break we're back looking at the possibility that following Comcast's decision to cast off its cable assets like MSNBC and CNBC, someone like Elon Musk could buy a controlling interest in the new company and turn MSNBC into a platform for right-wing trolls. You have many contacts among the lumberjacks to get 
you facts when someone attacks your imagination. But nobody has any respect. Anyway, they already expect you to all give a check to tax deductible charity organizations. Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is William Cohen, a former senior Wall Street investment banker for 17 years at Lazard Frere & Company, Merrill Lynch and J.P. Morgan Chase, as well as a New York Times bestselling author whose books include Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World, House of Cards, A Tale of Hubris and Wretched Excess on Wall Street, and most recently, Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Icon a founding partner at Puck News, where his latest article is Cable Prepares for a Value Extraction Era. Welcome to Background Briefing, William Cohen. Great to be here again, Ian. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us, Bill. And what do you make of Comcast spinning off MSNBC, E, CNBC, USA, Oxygen, Sci-Fi, and the Golf Channel? And, of course, this is happening when the ratings for MSNBC have dropped as a CNN, Fox is picking up in numbers since Trump's elections. So this seems to be quite a tectonic shift, but it's a part of a broader trend, is it not, which you've written about at Puck? Yes. Uh, you know, I think this is uh, uh, evidence of the new reality, uh, you know, among sort of the publicly traded uh, Hollywood uh, media uh, powerhouses. Uh, uh, Mike uh, Kavanaugh, uh, who uh, runs all of NBCU uh, for Comcast, for Brian Roberts and Comcast, sort of uh, telegraphed that uh, this could be happening a couple of weeks ago uh, during uh, the Comcast earnings call. Uh, he sort of lets slip, uh, obviously intentionally, that... Uh, Comcast uh, was looking at doing this uh, spinoff uh, of these uh, cable uh, properties that are still generating a tremendous amount of cash flow, but less and less each quarter. And it's sort of become a headache because, you know, every quarter the Wall Street analysts uh, ask about, you know, what are you going to do to sort of stop the, the slow deterioration of these businesses? And of course, there is no uh, answer for that because they, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do. And there's not really much uh, Comcast or Disney or Warner Brothers Discovery or Paramount Global or whatever can do about it. Uh, and so that's why you're seeing these sort of creative moves now to uh, try to get uh, these uh, assets that, again, are still generating a lot of cash, uh, generating a lot of value uh, uh, for because of the cash that they're generating, uh, but are deteriorating and declining. And that's why you're seeing this idea of uh, uh, spinning all of these uh, businesses that are in this category off uh, of Comcast uh, balance sheet and income statement into uh, its own publicly traded company with its own management uh, that uh, uh, Comcast will still own a, a bunch of. Uh, especially uh, Brian Roberts, who uh, uh, is the uh, one of the controlling shareholders in Comcast. So he'll continue to own it, but it'll be able to do its own thing, have its own balance sheet, and it'll no longer be Comcast's uh, headache to deal with every quarter. But Bill, what would stop somebody like Elon Musk, who spent $44 billion to buy Twitter, which he's turned into his own personal you know, political platform, if you will, uh, what's to stop him from buying up shares of this new entity and MSNBC becoming a right-wing cable outlet as opposed to a sort of pro-Democrat outlet? Well, every every public company is uh, for sale. Uh, it's just a matter of, of price, Ian. Uh, you know, and the world's richest man could uh, uh, easily uh, buy up uh, uh, the you know outstanding shares of the company that are publicly traded. He could uh, uh, make a tender offer uh, that would be probably hard uh, to resist. Uh, he could uh, uh, potentially uh, propose a merger with X uh, that could be uh, hard uh, for the uh, publicly uh, held 
uh, shareholders of this new entity to resist. Uh, I, you know, I don't know the specifics yet because they, they haven't uh, provided any real uh, uh, information in terms of, of a of a filing with the Securities Exchange Commission yet. But uh, Brian Roberts, uh, uh, just as he controls the voting shares of Comcast, uh, might uh, control the voting shares of this entity, and he could uh, just say no or, or dictate uh, who uh, a potential uh, buyer is, uh, sort of in the way that the Redstones uh, recently uh, uh, were able to control the sale process of Paramount Global, which of course is uh, experiencing its own similar declining cash flow uh, uh, situation uh, in its uh, uh, linear TV assets. Uh, so, uh, you know, potentially Brian Roberts, if he ends up uh, controlling the voting shares of this entity could, you know, stop Elon Musk from uh, uh, owning it. But uh, I'm sure at the end of the day, he's an economically driven animal. And uh, if he cared uh, that much about MSNBC or CNBC, um, he would not have included them in this spinoff company to let them fend for themselves. So uh, I suspect that whatever happens to them, he's going to be just fine with as long as he uh, maximizes uh, the value that he gets. And if uh, Elon Musk is the one uh, as the world's richest man worth 300 and whatever, 25 billion these days can pay uh, the most for this, uh, I'm sure it'll go through. So why do you think, or what do you know about Roberts in terms of uh, whether he has any political ideology? My sense is that the reason that MSNBC is sort of to the left, whereas CNN is somewhat in the center and, and Fox is on the right or the far right. My understanding is that that's a business decision because that's a, a market that she could seize while the others have grabbed what, the center and the, and the right. Or does the Roberts family, and Brian Roberts in particular, have, have some kind of sympathy for politics of the left? Uh, I, I think it's mostly a uh, has been an evolution, uh, of course, um, uh, and and mostly a, a business uh, a decision. Um, uh, you know, don't forget uh, GE once uh, owned uh, NBC uh, Universal, and uh, it was Jack Welch uh, uh, and others uh, like uh, you know Tom Rogers and David Zaslav and Bob Wright who started uh, CNBC and MSNBC uh, at inside of NBC. Um, uh, and Roger Ailes, of course, was uh, hanging around that hoop. And of course, he went on to, to leave uh, NBC and started Fox, uh, started the content of Fox, which became right wing. And, you know, J Jack Welch was obviously a Republican and no lo lover of uh, Democratic politics. So, uh, I don't think it was started uh, uh, to be ideologically on the left. Uh, it was uh, sold to uh, Comcast uh, uh, after the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, and I think, you know, by then it, it, uh, it sort of evolved uh, to have this uh, left uh, leaning uh, niche to fill the left leaning niche in the market. Uh, but, you know, I've told I've been told by people uh, who know Brian Roberts that he's pretty much had it with uh, uh, MSNBC at this point, which probably explains why MSNBC and CNBC were going to be part of this spun off entity, because, you know, I, I, it strikes me as a little odd, given the branding and the uh, cross pollinization that exists between NBC and MSNBC and CNBC that somehow MSNBC and CNBC would be floated off on their own boats. Uh, I, I suspect Brian Roberts, uh, even though I think he's probably a Democrat, I don't know for sure. Uh, I think he's probably a Democrat. Uh, it's probably had it with uh, the politics of, uh, of, uh, of MSNBC at this point. And, uh, you know, uh, some of the kind of lunacy that goes on at CNBC. So um, they'll be, uh, uh, they'll be off uh, sort of fending for themselves as part of this uh, a bigger group of uh, declining cable TV uh, uh, channels. 
Well, Bill, I actually couldn't uh, stand watching MSNBC on election night. Uh, it just was, yeah, it was just painful. embarrassing. It was yeah. painful. They, they looked like yeah. a bunch of high schoolers who got stood up at the prom. Uh, it was just, uh, I'd had to switch to, to CNN. And the, their ratings have dropped precipitously mm -hmm. since then. And, of course, Fox has gone up since then. So uh, I don't know whether this is permanent. What do you think about these seesawing ratings now with both MSNBC and CNN declining while Fox is picking up and on a roll? And, of course, well, there's not going to be any, anybody left at Fox. If Trump has his way, they'll all be appointed to, ca to cabinet positions. I mean, if you... Uh... Uh, uh, were uh, Ian uh, had, had had written a screenplay uh, about this and tried to sell it to uh, you know NBC Universal uh, out there in, in Hollywood, they would laugh at you and say that it wouldn't be possible that this uh, is would be the denouement of you know with Trump uh, picking uh, one Fox anchor after another to be in his cabinet, uh, and and I think you're right. I mean. Uh, uh, and, you know, in the lead up to the election, uh, of course, I once again got sucked into MSNBC and then only to sort of get feeling like um, they had completely missed the plot uh, come election night. And, uh, you know, are still sort of pounding away at that uh, theme that uh, they missed, uh, uh, you know, that led to, uh, you know, completely missed this uh, uh, rather uh, large thumping that Trump gave the Democrats. And uh, it's, as you say, it's become basically unwatchable. And that's probably explains why people aren't watching it. Uh, and uh, I think people are desperate for a place to go to get just like straight unbiased news like we used to get when we were both growing up, Ian, uh, you know, from either, you know, a Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor or Peter Jennings. Uh, you know, what happened to those news shows? They seem to have completely evaporated. Uh, uh, and maybe someone will get, get them back to us again and they will uh, attract a lot of uh, eyeballs. But that hasn't happened yet. Well, I think there's a broader societal shift, uh, Bill, uh, away from news and information to beliefs and feelings yes. and people do what's called reality shopping where Christians get their information from Christian broadcasting, conservatives from Fox, liberals from MSNBC, centrists from CNN, etc. That seems to be, I don't know how you reverse that trend uh, and I don't know how a powerful country like the United States with so much influence around the world uh, can operate when there's no consensus anymore about what is real and what is true. I I, I couldn't I couldn't have said it any better myself, Ian. Uh, I I don't understand it. It's you know again growing up, I thought there was generally a consensus on what the truth was and what we could believe and not believe, and uh, you know our politicians uh, were uh, you know I think. Uh, you know, by and large, uh, somewhat inspiring. Um, and uh, I always more or less felt that, uh, you know, they would do pretty much the right thing. Not always. Obviously, I grew up uh, in the Richard Nixon era and, uh, you know, lived through uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, you know, the former governor of California, who I never quite cotton to, but, you know, apparently he's now become, you know, uh, Mount Rushmore material. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I'm not sure I understand uh, the whole Trump phenomenon, but you know, then again, I I live in New York City, which sort of explains that, I guess. Uh, and grew up in Massachusetts, um, so I'm you know been living in my own little private Idaho for uh, you know 65 years now, um, and I'll you know just have to adjust to this new reality that there are people out there who think a lot differently than I do, and uh, you know have elected this guy. Not once, and not after seeing what he did the first time, but now a second time, even more decisively than the first uh, time, and after losing uh, the second time, so uh, you know in two thousand uh, twenty. So, um, you know, uh, I think then we've also seen 
a huge transformation in my uh, lifetime of, uh, you know, in media. And as, I, as I've said uh, many times, Ian, you know, when I uh, was uh, gr growing up and uh, had my first job before I went to Wall Street uh, at a newspaper in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, the, you know, the EBITDA margins at the newspaper were like 65% and they were, you know, gushing cash, not paying uh, journalists very much, but there were very few uh, uh, billionaires. Now, uh, there's a plethora of billionaires and media companies, EBITDA margins have evaporated and most are, are struggling. And the last thing they want to do is take on a, a billionaire or, you know, investigate a billionaire for fear that the billionaire will think nothing of suing them. And that's what's happening left and right now. So there's a real chilling effect uh, on investigative reporting. There's a real dissolution of local uh, journalism and there are consequences to both of those things. And, you know, the the the, the billionaire class is getting uh, bigger and more powerful all the time. And, and you can just see that in the evidence of who Donald Trump is surrounding himself with, uh, including his new best friend, uh, Elon Musk. No, it is a bit like more than the new Gilded Age. It's the sort of Gilded Age on steroids. But do you think that given the outrageous choices that Trump's made, for his cabinet picks that are really in your face and, and totally insulting. Is there a possibility that some of his people in MAGA world and and the, the kind of cowardly Republicans who are afraid of his, his vengeance, who go along with him like Mikey Johnson, is it possible that there's going to be some cracks in that edifice? Because, I mean, he's insulting the other branches of government, the Senate and the House, like you know, treating them like vassals. Yes, and he's uh, treating the uh, executive branch uh, like, like some sort of uh, uh, Star Wars uh, bar scene uh, by the people he's chosen. I mean, uh, I'm very anxious to see, you know, what happens uh, with the Treasury pick, Ian, because, um, you know, it, it, it's looking increasingly like he'll make a rational choice there and if he chooses you know mark rowan who is one of the subjects of my new book because i'm writing a new book about apollo where uh, he's the ceo uh that would be uh, considered a very rational choice and would be applauded on wall street um uh, and that would be probably this most sane choice of all which is of course one of the more important uh jobs uh you know if you think about it i mean uh when I when I first heard that he had selected Marco Rubio to be uh, Secretary of State, I uh, sort of threw up in my mouth. Uh, but now, given all of his other choices, uh, you know, Marco Rubio is looking like, a, you know, uh, Edward Statinius uh, choice uh, for Secretary of State. I mean, uh, uh, somebody who we almost could be proud of uh, compared to some of the other choices. But if he chooses Mark Rowan or or, uh, you know, any of the other names that are being bandied about that are, you know, quite uh, legitimate choices and uh, uh, confidence building choices uh, to be Secretary of the Treasury, then, you know, you, you could almost say to yourself that he's playing some sort of game here and trying to game the system, knowing that his, some of the choices he made will never make it, but he can say that he tried, you know, look, Matt Getz, I tried, you know, look, Pete Hegseth, I tried, you know, and go on to somebody potentially uh, more uh, palatable to a greater swath of the of, of the populace. Otherwise, I do agree there there will be begin to be cracks in this facade, and you know even Donald Trump can't live forever. And I think you know the post Trump era is going to look uh, quite different in the Republican Party than I think it looks now, uh, as as is the Democratic era post. You know, Obama and Biden and, uh, you know, Harris is going to look quite different, although we don't know what that's sure. going to be like yet. Right. But Musk and Teal and company, the Silicon Valley bros, the billionaire bros, they've got plan B with J.D. Vance, uh, who in many ways could be worse than Trump. So just in closing, though, I want to follow up on on uh, the Secretary of the Treasury. There was a fear that it would be Howard Lutnick, who is now going to be Commerce Secretary, Forbes has a, an article out today saying uh, Lutnick is the most hated man on Wall Street. <laughs> Not exactly 
an endorsement, right? Right. I think uh, Howard definitely has his uh, enemies on Wall Street after uh, the way, you know, the tragedy of 9-11 where some 650 you know, employees of Ken Kenner Fitzgerald uh, were, were killed, uh, innocent uh, victims. Uh, and I think there has been a longstanding now 23-year uh, controversy uh, related to the way uh, uh, Howard handled uh, that uh, tragedy. And, and not, you know, he was very effective at rebuilding the firm, but in terms of, you know, how he, he compensated the families of these uh, victims. Uh, you know, it's controversial because some people think he treated them fairly, others don't. Uh, um, he, he apparently offered uh, uh, jobs to any of the uh, children of the victims uh, at Cantor Fitzgerald, some of whom have actually taken him up on that. So he, he's both, I think, uh, uh, hated and somewhat admired, uh, you know, not a great, choice, frankly, for a cabinet position would not have been a good treasury choice, uh, despite Elon Musk pushing him. Uh, but now people are thinking, you know, commerce's mandate has expanded and he might get some of the uh, responsibilities uh, that uh, Musk hopes that he'll uh, get and will be beneficial for Musk. Again, uh, you know, this is like uh, the Star Wars Bar scene, Ian. I mean, I I, I can't understand uh, these picks. Uh, but again, uh, maybe Marco Rubio will turn out to have been a good pick if he chooses Mark Rowan or Kevin Warsh uh, or Scott Besant. Maybe for Treasury, maybe uh, one of those will turn out to be an inspiring pick. But um, the rest of it looks pretty bleak, to be honest. Well, William Cohen, I thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you, Ian. Always a pleasure. Well, thank you, Bill. And again, I've been speaking with William Cohen as a former senior Wall Street investment banker for 17 years at Lazard, Frere & Company, Merrill Lynch and J.P. Morgan Chase, as well as a New York Times bestselling author whose books include Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World, House of Cards, A Tale of Hubris and Wretched Excess on Wall Street, and most recently, Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Icon, a founding partner at Puck News, where his latest article is Cable Prepares for the Value Extraction Era. We're going to take a brief station break We're back looking into fears that Putin will retaliate against Biden's permission to allow Ukraine to fire longer range missiles into Russia. Welcome back. I'm Ian Masters, and this is Background Briefing, available 24-7 at backgroundbriefing.org. And joining us now is Michael Gorham, who's a professor of Russian studies at the University of Florida and the recent Archie K. Davis Fellow at the National Humanities Center. He served for 12 years as associate editor of the Russian Review and is the author of multiple award-winning books on Russian language and politics, including After Newspeak and Speaking in Soviet Tongues. He's currently completing a book on the impact of the Internet and social media on Russian political communications called Networking Putinism, the Rhetoric of Power in the Digital Age. Welcome to Background Briefing, Michael Gorham. Good to be with you. So, Michael, there's a lot of concern that uh, Putin is furious uh, about the Atakams and the British storm shadow missiles that Biden and the British Prime Minister are now authorized to strike into Russian territory in a response to Russia deploying North Korean troops. So at this point, the U.S. embassy in Kiev has been evacuated for fears that uh, Putin may retaliate against it. What are you hearing on Russian uh, media? Because Putin apparently has a temper and looks like this move by Biden has gotten under his skin. Uh, yes, it uh, it certainly has been dominating the news as far as I've been following it in Russia. And uh, this is uh, a, a typical uh, fodder for the nighttime uh, 
uh, political talk shows, and they are, as you can imagine, up in arms. I think the uh, the one thing that gives me pause uh, in uh, thinking that something dramatic might happen is that uh, you also hear at the same time that this is a very much of a, a Biden slamming the door on his way out move and that uh, a little bit of patience for another, what is it, 20, 30 days, and uh, we'll be in a much better position up until this this move, uh, this decision uh, by the Biden administration. Uh, uh, these uh, talk show hosts could hardly uh, hardly keep from showing their their glee and joy over the the changing fortunes of uh, of the Russian Federation uh, with the election of Donald Trump. Uh, so I think the uh, the general sentiment is that uh, yes, this is bad. Uh, this nuclear doc doc uh, doctrine that was just uh, revised it came out it's been in the works for several months there there's nothing really surprising about the the wording there that's not a direct reaction to this uh but um but i think the uh, the thing that gives us hope if you can even talk about that these days is uh is the fact that um you know trump's inauguration is right around the corner and uh, the uh, uh, presumption is he will uh, bring about a, a deal in ending the war that uh, is uh, uh, extremely beneficial to the to the to the Putin regime. But is it uh, pretty clear in Russian media and certainly at the Kremlin that now they are saying that because of these uh, U.S. and British missiles and I imagine the French will add their scalp missile to the mix, that they're in fact at war with the United States. They've been saying that forever, that yes. this is a proxy war with the United States. They're not really at war with Ukraine, but at, with the United States. But now they're saying the United States is directly involved in the war, and therefore they feel they have to retaliate. Is that is that what you're hearing? Uh, yes, but uh, as, you, as you say yourself, I've been... I've been hearing this since uh, essentially the spring of 2022 when they realized uh, this war needed to be framed as a war between Russia and NATO and the United States in particular, that the Russian population just didn't buy the idea that that there was a, a justified reason to, to bomb uh, Russian brethren uh, Ukrainians. So uh, it's something akin to a boy who cried wolf. I don't I don't think. This this certainly exacerbates the situation, but I don't think it's a a, a significant enough uh, change in the situation. I mean, it's not like you have American troops lining up on the on the Ukrainian border the way North Korean troops are. Uh, so that, I think it 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 just sort of those complaints are are there, but they they ring hollow in light of uh, the way this war has been framed for the past. Uh, uh, thousand days. So, Michael, I recently interviewed Lawrence Wilkerson, the former chief of staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell, and he was dubious about whether the North Korean troops were in Russia to begin with. And I got lots of mail from people saying, how could that be true? So are the Russians admitting that they have North Korean troops? Because my understanding is there's supposed to be 10,000, and it's the 11th Corps group of North Korean troops that we're talking about here, which are their best units trained for penetration, sabotage, and assassination. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd have to defer to military experts on 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 that. I, I don't know. I, I don't know for a fact what what the status is. Uh, I, I know that they have been discussed and acknowledged in the in the Russian media. Uh, the, the the North Korean presence, but um, I don't know for a fact that they have proverbial boots on the ground, either uh -huh. in the Kursk region uh, in Russia, where the Ukrainian troops have uh, have occupied, or uh, or elsewhere. Well, Western sources and NATO sources are saying that they're worried at the moment that the the Ukrainian lines, uh, defensive lines could collapse and that they fear that up to 100,000 uh, North Korean troops could eventually be deployed if there's a breakthrough. 
So I take it, I mean, I know what goes on Russian television is just ridiculous propaganda, but is there a sense that they feel that they're winning? Because even in the in, in NATO circles now, there's concerns that they are winning this war. And now, of course, we learn today that Biden has not only authorized uh, the use of Atakams to fire deep into into Russia, he's also authorized uh, transferring anti-personnel mines, obviously, to defend uh, the Ukrainian lines, which may be shaky at this moment. What's, what's your reading yeah. on it? What are you hearing? Uh, there's no there's no doubt uh, about the, the the sense of uh, of uh, superiority now that one gets when watching uh, watching the Russian um, news media and uh, political talk shows. They are very much of of the mind that they're uh, they have the upper hand, and um, quickly. Uh, kind of deflect any talk even of uh, ceasefire negotiations or even peace negotiations, uh, arguing that, uh, no, it's it's really Trump that should be calling Putin and uh, basically a- acquiescing to him rather than uh, the other way around, since uh, Putin and the Russian military now have such a such a dominant presence and they're, they've got a an enormous amount of momentum. Well, there have been some strange uh, stuff on Russian television about the, well, first of all, they're denying that Trump had that call with him uh, a week ago. Well, no, it'll be two weeks ago tomorrow. They're denying it took place. But then the day after Ruskia won, the, the main television propaganda outlet published naked pictures of, of Melania Trump and then Petrushev, the national security advisor, was interviewed making not so veiled threats, <laughs> saying that a lot of American presidents have been assassinated, and uh, you owe us. You know, more or less saying we we've got blackmail on you, and and you're going to have to behave yourself. So, hmm. what do you what did you make of that? Particularly Patrushev's veiled threats about saying something like how many American presidents have been assassinated. <laughs> Yeah, he uh, he certainly is uh, a uh, quite a loose wire, a loose cannon, and, and character these days. Uh, he is still very much has as Putin's ear, as far as I understand. Even though he's uh, officially been somewhat demoted, but um, uh, he's always been a, a creature of conspiracy theories and uh, pretty sharp rhetoric. So I don't. Uh, I don't know how seriously those words ought to be taken. I know that uh, the Russian television, just like uh, the American media, can't resist uh, the salacious stories of involving half-naked celebrities. And uh, so seeing old Melania photos uh, reappear on Russian television uh, wasn't uh, wasn't all that surprising to me. But they, they definitely were prominently dis- displayed. Right, but it it does seem that they're aimed at Trump, aren't they? That you know, behave yourself. We're a little bit disappointed in you. You better get with the program. How would else would you interpret it? Uh, well, that that certainly could it could be interpreted that way. I really I really don't obviously have an, any knowledge of what uh, what sort of dirt, if any, they have on on Donald Trump and whether that was meant as a uh, as a not so subtle warning to him. Um, but the fact of the man, the the matter is, he's he's made his made his name on on uh, that sort of uh, ce- his celebrity status. So that as as has been shown on, on U.S. soil, that sort of information uh, and news doesn't doesn't really affect him negatively. If anything, it uh, it's uh, it it helps him. Sure, oh. as he said, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and not lose a vote. And that seems to be the way, particularly given the kind of people he's appointing to the highest levels of his cabinet. So, right. I think the uh, I think the there there is a there is a combined sort of attitude toward that. I I think they they definitely see Trump as uh, more of a kindred spirit uh, than most any Rush American politician and. In that in that sense, a strategic ally, particularly as regards to his view uh, 
uh, about NATO and his views on the Ukraine war. He espouses, at least talks about espousing uh, the anti anti woke values and traditional values that that Vladimir Putin so loves to talk about these days. But that doesn't mean he isn't at the same time uh, viewed through the the lens of what in uh, Soviet uh, spy spy language was uh, known as the the useful idiot. Um, that is a technical term dating back to the KGB referring to uh, uh, advocates in foreign countries who basically tow the party line without fully recognizing they're, to they're towing the party line. So when they see people like uh, Tulsi Gabbard in particular, who's, uh, who's, who's been a, a, a star of Russian nighttime political talk shows for really four years now, given the sorts of things that she's been saying, when they see her nominated for the head of national national security, it's uh, it's music to their ears. So I think uh, there are, there are multiple levels of uh, how the Trump administration, incoming Trump administration, is being perceived. Uh, Eve, there, it's it's mostly positive, but of course um, there is that that sober warning that yeah, we we had him for four years before, and it it wasn't all uh, peachy keen. Well, there's also a history of, of Russian leaders believing American movies as the truth. For example, the former head of the KGB, or the last head of the KGB, General Krichkov, he watched Three Days of the Condor hundreds of times. He was convinced that <laughs> that was really how the CIA operates. And mm -hmm. now, apparently, all the top-ranking Russian officials are watching this American film called Civil War, starring Kirsten Dunst, which in Russia it's been titled The Fall of the Empire, and that they really believe uh, that civil war is coming and that uh, the Americans are going to tear each other apart. What do you make of that? Well, that's what they've been working for uh, really since 2014-15, hasn't it? Um, the uh, social media campaign in the, in the 2016 election was in part designed to support Trump, but the main goals of that was to uh, basically uh, deepen the, the fractures, the the divides in American society to such a point that it would that it would fracture or fall apart. And that's that's sort of the the calling card of uh, of Russian disinformation now. It's not as much to support one ideology over another. Or even one particular person over another, but to to sow uh, distrust uh, in the system, so that the that that system is more likely to to crumble on its own accord, and and I think so that so I think that's that's not that's not a new strategy by any stretch of the means, but there's no question that Trump's election gives reason to think that the the uh, percentage of likelihood of that coming about has uh, has risen uh, quite ex considerably. Well, Patrushev's been talking about it again on Russia One. Uh, he, he just said, projects like Black Lives Matter and the rampant promotion of transgender theories are aimed at the spiritual degradation of a population already in a state of apathy. Ordinary citizens won't lift a finger to preserve America's unity, knowing they mean nothing to their own government. The U.S. authorities, without understanding the consequences, are destroying themselves step by step. So I guess, you know, there's an element of wishful thinking there, but it's not entirely inaccurate. Uh, no, but it's uh, the same, I think, the same strategy that uh, has been effectively used by uh by certain political parties in ginning up the the uh, the morality wars to an extent that really give them far more uh, attention and uh, concern that than they really deserve. Uh, in the end, I, I'm not sure if this country is a well. I'm I'm in, I'm not an American, but Amer Americanist by training. But uh, it it seems that. Um, they would like the uh, transgender issue to be front and center uh, because it is a, a, a 
portrait of the most extreme view of a of a of a of a torn American culture and um, paints the United States in a, a a light that for ethnic Russians seems to be quite different from the from the value system that they that they grew up grew up on but the the fact the fact the actual fact of that of those visions of those stereotypes bringing down a, a country um i'm not i'm not so sure that that's where the that that's where the fault lines the real fault lines are going to appear right but just in closing michael you have the third most powerful politician in the country the speaker of the house mike johnson just today uh, going on about uh, how we can't possibly have this transgender woman that just got elected to the House of Representatives from Delaware uh, use women's bathrooms. And now, you know, he's going on about this phony issue that the trans are taking over the world. So it's happening here. Yeah, that that's true. But uh, he, he's now in power and he is one of, uh, you know, uh, a Congress that's completely controlled by his party and the White House now controlled by his party. And I think the, uh, I would hope that the American population would now expect them to get to work and, and make, make real changes for the better for the American population rather than uh, spouting this sort of ideological uh, uh, culture war nonsense that, that has, that proved effective for them while in the minority. Well, Michael Gorham, I thank you very much for joining us here today. My pleasure. Good to be with you. And again, I've been speaking with Michael Gorham, a professor of Russian studies at the University of Florida and a recent Archie K. Davis Fellow at the National Humanities Center. He served for 12 years as associate editor of the Russian Review and is the author of multiple award-winning books on Russian language and politics, including After Newspeak and Speaking in Soviet Tongues. He is currently completing a book on the impact of the Internet and social media on Russian political communication called Networking Putinism, the Rhetoric of Power in the Digital Age. This has been Background Briefing. I'm Ian Masters, and I'd like to thank producer Graham Fitzgibbon and assistant producer Asher Price. If you missed any of today's program or would like to explore our vast archives, you can find us at backgroundbriefing.org, where we include extended interviews, searchable by topic, and have made it easier for you to sign up for daily email updates that provide links to resources, articles, and books discussed on the program. Also, you can find links there to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we encourage your ratings and reviews on those platforms. And you can find us on Twitter and Facebook at Ian Masters Media. And please do help us reach more listeners by sharing this program with friends, family and colleagues. And to help sustain this program into the future and assure it remains free to all, please take a moment to support us by going to backgroundbriefing.org slash donate or to publictruthmedia.org, where your tax-deductible donations, large and small, keep us broadcasting. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another background briefing. Bye for now. Well